Our scripture reading this morning is from the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. We've been in the book of Genesis for several weeks now, and we're going to look at chapter 3 again, beginning with verse 1, reading through verse 24, Genesis chapter 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord Yahweh, the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, "I, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself said, who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desires shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, for the reading of God's word, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open. Genesis 3, since we're going to be referring to our text a number of times this morning. Well, you're looking for fashion advice? Pretty obvious you don't ask me. We won't go into any more enough said about that. But although I really can't help you with upgrading your look in a way that's helpful, God's Word tells us about clothing that everybody needs to hear, and I probably can help by reminding you of what the Bible says about clothing. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 3, 
we're going to look at three sets of clothing. And understanding those three sets of clothing is very important for each one of us today. Now, the first set of clothing that we read about in Genesis is the birthday suit. Does anybody know what a birthday suit is? Maybe kids, some of you are smiling, so some of you know. Uh, It's what you are wearing when you are born. That is, no clothing. And we read about birthday suits, not in our text, but the verse before our text. So chapter 2, verse 25. So let's look at that now. Chapter 2, verse 25, we read there, And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Now, Adam and Eve didn't have any clothes in the beginning of our history. They were naked, as verse 25 says. But nakedness in the Old Testament and ancient literature doesn't only mean that they didn't have any clothes. It did mean that. But it was more than that. Nakedness was actually a window, as it were, a window on the soul where you could see a person's heart or soul, their moral condition. So nakedness is someone to be vulnerable because you can see them as they are. But there's a moral quality to that in some of ancient literature. And so in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, Adam and Eve, they were morally good, weren't they? They were upright, they were righteous. And their nakedness showed their good character. They were naked, they were good, therefore there was no shame They were upright. God made them good. However, after Adam and Eve rebelled against God and sinned, we read that, then nakedness reveals something else, doesn't it? And so let's take a look at chapter 3, verse 7, the first part of 7, where we read, Then the eyes of both Adam and Eve, they were open, and they knew that they were naked. This is written right after they have disobeyed God and committed high treason against the living God. And so now Adam's character has now changed for the worse. And now his eyes are open and his nakedness now reveals what? A morally dark heart. So how does Adam like his birthday suit now? He doesn't, right? Now he is sinful. So we read about a second suit of clothing. The first suit is the birthday suit. What's the second suit of clothing that we read about in our text? Let's look at verse 7 again. We'll read the whole verse this time. Then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened. They knew that they were naked. And then what? And they sewed fig leaves together. And they made themselves coverings or loincloths. Coverings, literally. Verse 7 says, they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, Adam and Eve did put together our second suit in the text, fig leaves. That happened. But Genesis isn't telling us mostly about a wardrobe choice. As much as it is telling us about Adam's moral condition. Adam here, after his rebellion against God... Adam is trying to find a moral covering for his ugly heart. And he's trying to cover up his sin through his own efforts. Here we see that sinful Adam is the founder of the first false religion after the fall. He tries to take steps to cover up his ugliness, to make up for his sin. And so, if you look at all the world religions around you today, these all follow after Adam and Eve's attempts here in chapter 3, verse 7. Mormonism. Mormonism is an attempt to um, kind of follow Jesus, but really to make yourself worthy. Islam. Submit to the five pillars. Judaism. Keep Torah. Even some forms within Christendom, even Roman Catholicism can be this. All are human attempts to make up for or to cover our ugly sin. 
But how does Adam's covering work? Does it, in fact, blot out his sinful heart? Well, let's look at verse 8. We know the answer, don't we? Verse 8. And Adam and Eve, this is after they've made coverings for themselves, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife went out to meet the Lord and to have fellowship with him because their coverings were sufficient. Is that what it says? No. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So here we read that the presence of God draws near and Adam hides from God. He goes the opposite direction. Adam's covering didn't solve his moral condition and it didn't allow him into God's presence to have good fellowship with a holy, righteous God. And that is because, as we read from Scripture, God's presence is one of holiness and beauty and a perfection of majesty which which cannot tolerate sin. Adam cannot get rid of his sin, and he cannot cover it up through his own efforts. And that's why we read here that Adam goes away from the true living God. If I could just chase a rabbit for just a minute here. Uh, Within evangelical churches in our country, there used to be, and still is a phrase or philosophy of ministry called being seeker-sensitive. And it assumes that most people are seeking fellowship with God. It's just up to a church, according to this philosophy, to bring them in and lower the barriers for the seekers so that they can come to God. Now, it is true, as John Calvin said, that people are by nature religious. However, to say that people are seeking fellowship with the living God of Scripture, it's ridiculous. If the Holy Spirit isn't supernaturally working in someone's heart, our natural direction is to always go away from the true living God. Now, sometimes that going away from the true living God might mean we're very religious or we're interested in spirituality, but that's not seeking true fellowship with a living, true God on his terms. In fact, if anyone is a seeker in Genesis 3, who is the seeker? Seeker is God, right? Who is the one who calls to sinful Adam and seeks him out? It's God. All right, now let's get back to this theme of clothing. Not only does God seek his elect when we run away from him, but God also provides, this is the third set of clothing that we read in our text. God provides a proper covering. Let's look at verse 21. Chapter 3, verse 21. Third set of clothing. And the Lord Yahweh, the Lord God, made for Adam and Eve, for his wife, garments of skins. And the Lord God clothed them. Man still cannot live in the presence of a holy God. But God's clothes, his clothing for Adam and Eve, tell us how they and you could someday return to live in God's presence. The curse has not been completely overturned. But here is God's answer to how you and I, born with birthday suits that expose a moral, corrupt heart and soul, how you and I, born sinners, how we have hope to return back in the presence of God. And in chapter 3, verse 21, we read about then our third set of clothing. Now, it's important to note that this set of clothing is something that God provides. Man's covering, our attempt to deal with our sin, just doesn't work. We need God to fix our sin. And only God can provide clothing to cover our ugly sin. 
And if we look at verse 21 carefully, what kind of clothing does God provide? Well, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins. We get uh, an idea about what this is about in other texts of Scripture. In fact, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, we get insight into what kind of clothing this is. Hebrews 9, verse 22 says, Indeed, under God's law, almost everything must be purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The clothing here that God provides, this is the clothing of animal skins. Animals were killed. Blood was shed by God to provide a covering that would be good enough for God's holiness. So, is Genesis 3 a polemic against PETA and a command that we should wear animal furs? No. That's a moralistic reading of the text. The point of Genesis 3 is that only God can provide an adequate covering for our sins. And this covering would ultimately happen through the shedding of blood. Are these skins enough that God provided in Genesis 3 for Adam and Eve to to stay in the presence of God? Are these animal skins enough for all the people of the world to have hope to enter the presence of God? No. These skins were real, but they were not sufficient. They were just signs or types. And they point us ahead, these signs, to the shedding of blood that is truly the only thing that can cover our sins. They point us ahead not to the shedding of blood of bulls and goats, but to the shedding of blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And in fact, friends, when his blood was shed, we also read about clothing there too, don't we? John chapter 19, the Gospel of John, verses 23 and 24. What do we read there? So, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, that is, they've just nailed him to the cross, and they hoisted him up. When the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, had crucified Jesus, shedding his blood, they took his garments, and they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also Christ's tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but let's cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture. So the soldiers did these things. Friends, once your sin, all of your sins, once they were placed upon or given to Christ, What happened to him? See this theme of clothing again, don't we? When your sins were placed upon Christ the substitute, his clothing was actually stripped off, exposing his nakedness, really your sinfulness. And then not only were his clothes stripped off, but his blood was shed. Christ stood in your place and offered his life in place of yours so that your blood would not be shed by a holy, righteous God. So, friends, Christ's death in your place covers your sin if you trust in Jesus. Not only does Christ shed blood remove God's wrath, which is how he fulfills the shedding of blood in Genesis 3, but what else does Christ do? See, the theme of Christ, his clothing was stripped off, his blood was shed. That's what Genesis 3 is talking about. But you know what Christ also does for you if you trust in him? The Bible also speaks of another set of clothing. Bill actually read this. The ESV doesn't translate it well. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, we read there, 27, I mean, for as many of you as were 
baptized into Christ by faith. It says here, have put on Christ. Literally in the Greek, it's you have been clothed with Christ. That's what the Greek, that's a better translation. So literally, not only does Christ remove your curse by his shed blood, but his righteousness, his keeping the law, which is all about Galatians 3, that's the main theme. The one who is born of a woman, born under the law, his keeping the law, his righteousness, is now, if you trust in Jesus, is provided to you as a new set of clothing, as it were. Jesus clothes you with his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made Christ who had no sin to be sin, so that what? So that in Christ you might be the righteousness of God. If you have Christ, his righteousness now clothes you. You see this theme of clothing introduced in Genesis 3 ultimately has its fulfillment in Christ's work. His clothes stripped away, his blood shed, and ultimately him providing the white righteous robes of righteousness to all who belong to him. Where does that leave us? Friends, the only way that you can draw near to a holy God and not be destroyed is if you have the clothing that only Christ can provide. Literal suit, of course not. The clothing, his work, his righteousness, credited to you by faith alone. And that's what the Reformation was all about, wasn't it? How can naked, sinful people like us ever have hope to enter the presence of a holy God? Solus Christus. Christ's work, his righteousness alone. Our fig leave attempts are tragic. It is only what God provides in Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can get this righteousness is not through your efforts. So, and, and this is where, again, it's so important in our circles or within Christendom. There are many churches that, that love Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus in Texas, right? Um, everybody's all about Jesus in Texas. But so many churches, it's about Jesus and what? Jesus in you. Yeah, there's Jesus. You need him. But now you've got to work along with God and cooperate with that grace. Kind of finish that clothing up. Or, well, there's Jesus. He's shed his blood to take away your sin. But now it's kind of up to you to be that covenantally faithful person and craft your own garment of righteousness. Uh Uh-uh. The Reformation in Scripture, it is only the clothing that God provides from first to last. And that's the clothing that comes from Christ alone. And the only way you get that clothing, that covering, is not through Jesus and you. It's not through religion, certainly. It is only through the grace of God alone. Through trusting, through faith alone as the instrument that you can be covered in Christ's righteousness alone. That's the gospel, friends. That's the solas of the Reformation that we've looked at the last few weeks. It's in all of Scripture. It's in the beginning chapters of Genesis. And that's what we get excited about. That's what we need to share with our friends It's not, hey, I've got a great religious program, spirituality, that I'm in touch with this thing that's really inspired me. No. We need to tell them about the clothing that Christ offers and only Jesus offers.
It's also good news for each one of you who have trusted in Jesus alone. You know, we don't know how long we have to live. Um, Some of us in our church may not make it to 2019. Uh, It may be a completely unexpected person. We don't know. But as we reach the end of our time, like J. Gresham Machen uh, on his deathbed, who died very young, relatively speaking, what were his dying words? Thank God for the act of obedience of Christ. No hope without it. Thank God for Christ's righteousness that clothes me. That's what we need to remember. That is our only hope. And that is a great hope and a confidence. It is being clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The covering that God provides for all who trust in him. Let's go before God's throne in prayer. Let's pray.